always enjoy New Year's. You know, a lot of people like to, to make New Year's resolutions, but you know, there's just something about turning the page or turning the calendar and finding there's nothing else. And you get to start anew. I remember a uh, Winnie the Pooh cartoon where Winnie the Pooh pulls off December and there's nothing left. And he begins to panic, thinking that it's the end of the world, because there are no more days. And so he goes to Christopher Robin, and, and Christopher Robin says, Oh, you silly old bear. And he gives him a new calendar. But there's just something about newness, something about being able to turn a page and just start over, as if there's a new season, a new chapter in a book that is written. And so often people foolishly decide things like, well, you know what, in the next year, in 2020, I'm going to become a better version of me because I'm going to diet. Anyone ever say that at the new year? Yeah. And that works for a very short time. And uh, then we realize that we just like chocolate. And... You know, sometimes to stop eating all chocolate, you have to finish eating the chocolate. And so, but, uh, and you know, sometimes we decide, you know what, I'm going to stop doing this, or I'm going to do this in the new year. And we come up with these New Year's resolutions. And, and actually, there's, there's kind of a, a scary past to how those began. You see, in Rome, the people would get together... And, and they would have, to celebrate the end of the year, in the beginning of the new year, they would have these huge parties. And at these parties, people would get, get drunk, and, and most of them would have affairs on their spouses. And then they would go home, and they would resolve to be better in the new year. Knowing that at the next new year they were going to intentionally do the same things again. And so it became kind of this thing that people would do just to say, okay, I'm sorry about yesterday, even though I'm not really sorry, but I'm not going to do that anymore. And, and that's why there's a tradition to them not working. Because really, in order for a change to occur, the change has to be here. We have to change the way we think, and then we have to move it down into here to change the way we live. But we have a new year to decide who we will be in that new year. And I love the place where we're at in Mark because we've come to a place where there are two types of people that we're going to look at. There's a group of faithless people and a group of faithful people. And Mark puts them right next to each other almost to compare and contrast how they respond to our Jesus. And I think it's important to take a look at that today because as we approach the new year, we have a new season in front of us. A new opportunity in front of us. There's a newness to that new year. Not only that, it's the 20s. And who knows what the new decade will bring. Who knows the changes that it will bring. But what we can know is that we have a new chance, <coughs> a new opportunity to become something new. I want to invite you to open up with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, it says, Jesus left there 
And he went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. Now it had been a while since he had been to his hometown, which is Nazareth. It's where he went after, after his family fled <coughs> to Egypt. They went back to Nazareth. And Nazareth was a small town of about 500 people that they didn't have a very good reputation. And the last time that Jesus was, Jesus was there was the time where he went into the synagogue and he began to teach in the synagogue and they handed him the scroll of Isaiah and he rolled it open to a certain place and he began to read and he said, Today this is fulfilled in front of you. And on that day, they chased him out of the synagogue and they led him to the brow of the hill with the intention of tossing him off. But instead, he walked through the crowd and left. That's the last time it was recorded that he was in his hometown. You can find the story in Luke chapter 4. But since then, Jesus hadn't been back to Nazareth. But we know that during that time, some of the things that were going on in Nazareth were that his brothers and sisters didn't buy into who he was. Because it says earlier in Mark that his brothers and sisters came and they said that they needed to take him home because surely he had lost his mind. And so if his brothers and sisters living in this small community of about 500 people think that, imagine what the rest of the people there think. But then again, when Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus goes back to his hometown and he encounters a group of faithless people. And the faithless are those who view him as only human. And really, this is the way it is in society. Now, there's a lot of people that we come in contact with who when they see Jesus, when they hear his name, they think of someone who was only human. They think of someone who was a good teacher. They think of someone who was this. Was, uh, uh, they come up with a whole bunch of things. But they don't understand him to be the Son of God. They don't understand him to be God in the flesh. And so they don't view him the way that we do. They don't understand him the way that we do. But if you could imagine, these are many of the people who grew up or who lived in the community and watched Jesus grow up from a child. <clears throat> They're the people who used to hire Jesus to come and work as a carpenter for them to build things or to fix things. These are the people who for 30 years saw Jesus as a certain way before he began his ministry. They couldn't imagine him any other way. They couldn't understand him to be anything except what he was because that's all they had known him as. And oftentimes when we go out into the community and we tell people about our Jesus and we share with our friends and our family the amazing things about our Jesus, 
they're people who all their lives have only understood Jesus one way. And they can imagine understanding him in a different way. They can imagine understanding Jesus to be something different than what he'd always been. And it even says that they marveled at his miracles. He said, he even does these miracles. How is this possible? Because he's only this. See, sometimes the biggest hang-up that we have in change is understanding we're wrong. Sometimes the biggest change, the biggest obstacle we have to becoming what we've always wanted to be or something, a better version of ourselves, is to understand that we were wrong in how we created the version of ourselves that exists. And sometimes it's not even admitting we're wrong. It's accepting it. Because oftentimes we understand how wrong we are. <coughs> but when we change, changing is admitting to everybody else that we were wrong. And oftentimes that's the hardest part in change. These people were amazed at his teaching. They marveled at his miracles. They had heard the stories about Jesus. They had seen the things that he had done, oftentimes firsthand. Everyone knew about what he could do. Everyone had heard him teach and the power that was there with his teaching, but yet still they said, no, it's just got to be a regular person because I just can't confess that I was wrong. They saw everything in front of them. And so they rejected his wisdom. They questioned where it came from. Even though Jesus offers an opportunity to actually experience life and to live life and to have life, <coughs> those without faith question the source of it question the rightness of it. And they say, surely society can't be wrong. Surely the way I've been doing things can't be wrong. Surely people can come up with a better way to do things than Jesus has. And so they question his wisdom. They reject his wisdom. And they try to live a different way. As if somehow humanity has ever come up with a way to truly live life. People have come up with way after way after way to deceiving us that certain things are living. And if you watch TV often enough, you will see that there are certain things that are portrayed as actually living. Owning certain things to find life is living. And you've got to have this next coolest thing. And if you don't have this next coolest thing, you're not really living anymore. And you need to go and visit these places because when you go and visit these places, you can actually live life and enjoy it. And if you just go to school and you get this next degree and then you can start doing this, you can start living life. And so, in society, we have come up with a lot of ways to deceive people into believing that if you do this, you'll start living. But the truth is in his wisdom. That the only way to live life is to forfeit it. And we live in a society that can't imagine such a thing. What do you mean? To live life, I have to give mine up? Yeah. 
Because the moment that you give up living for yourself, you can begin to live life and enjoy life. They questioned his wisdom. And they rejected his compassion. It says that he could do, that he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Now I want to be clear and, and, and help you to understand that the reason that he couldn't heal was not because he can't bring healing to those without faith, but that their lack of faith could not receive it. Because certainly when Jesus went in and he raised the little girl from the dead, she didn't have faith that it would happen. But yet he raised her. You see, his inability to heal was not based upon faith. It was based upon people's willingness to receive what was being offered. And so they rejected his compassion, which is the most beautiful and amazing thing about him. When you begin to look at all the things that he is and all the things that he does, the most amazing thing is that he loves us and wants to touch us and bring healing to us. I love that idea of healing. Because healing, the greatest healing that he does is not our physical ailments. <clears throat> to me, it's less of a miracle when God restores a missing limb than it is when he restores a broken heart. See, the greatest healing that he does is within us. Because we live in a broken world with a broken system that is good at one thing and one thing only. That is wounding people. See, that was the purpose of sin. The purpose of sin was to bring death. Because death is separation from God. And those deep wounds are really separation from God. They're places where we will not let God go because we're scared of what he'll do when he gets there. We're embarrassed of what he's going to see when he gets there. And so oftentimes we act as faithless people rejecting his compassion, afraid of what his touch will do in our lives. I actually loved just a couple minutes ago Sandy told me, you can't go do announcements because we're hugging. And hugging is healing. So there's something about a personal touch that brings healing. There's something about the compassion and warmth of someone touching you that begins to melt away the emotional pain and the scars that exist. That's why Jesus wanted to touch. That's why Jesus was so interested in healing and sharing his compassion because he knew and he understood the brokenness that exists within us. He knew and understood the hurt and the pain and the suffering that exists within us and he wants to reach out and to touch and begin to bring healing to it. Because until we heal, until we can 
deal with the emotional scars and the wounds that we have until we allow him to come into those dark corners and touch us in those places and begin to do the work that he wants to do within us, he can't possibly send us out to do the work that he needs us to do. Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith because they were so unwilling to receive healing. He was amazed at their lack of faith because they were unwilling to receive his compassion and his love. But then there was another group. Because it says, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Jesus left there and he began to go and he began to teach. And he began to model to his disciples and his apostles, okay, this is what I want you to do as you go from town to town. And then calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over spirits, evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff. <clears throat> no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if in any place, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Jesus begins to deal then with the faithful people. The faithless people were rejecting his wisdom. They were rejecting his compassion. They were not receiving the things that he offered. And so Jesus began to work with the faithful. And I love what it says about the faithful as he sent them out. The first thing he told them to do was to reflect his compassion. That's why he gave them authority over evil spirits. That's why he sent them out to heal. He sent them out to touch lives. <coughs> he sent them out to love. in ways that they could not receive unless God was present. And I love it says that he, they anointed the people with oil. See, anointing with oil, the oil was always a sign of God's presence there. And so they would anoint with oil, not because there was anything within the oil, but the oil signified to everyone, God's presence is here. And so they would anoint them with oil as a way of saying, this is the power of God at work, this is not us. But they went out to make people whole. Those who had spent so much time with Jesus, those who had been touched by him so many times, that within themselves they were becoming whole, then began to go out to bring wholeness to others. And he sent them out to trust for his provision. He sent them out and said, I want you to go out, and I want you to not bring a lot of things with you. So that every day you trust that God will provide for you. He didn't send them out this way later. But this moment was about understanding and developing trust in a relationship. And then he said, I want you to be content where you're at. And really this is a struggle for all of us in life because we live in a world that is all about more. But he says, wherever you go, when you find a place, I want you to stay in that place until you leave town. 
And the reason that was a big deal was because once they went into town and once they began to anoint people and people began to be healed and once they began to teach with the authority that God had given them and lives were beginning to be touched and changed, all the richest people in town would come and say, hey, why don't you stay with us so that we can have the prestige of welcoming you into our house and everyone will come to our house to see you and they will connect you with us which would be a tempting thing for all of us. But he said, I want you to stay where you're at once you go. Reject the offers of the rich who are trying to buy you and buy your blessing. Stay with those who welcome you first. Be content. Show discernment. If people don't welcome you, if a town won't receive you, say, so shake the dust off of your sandals and continue on your way. Understand, as you minister, as you begin to share God's word with people, when the door is closed, and continue on to a place that can be more fruitful. And the last thing was to share the gospel. They went out to preach. See, we have been called to share the gospel. We have been called to preach the message. But our ability to do so begins here within us. It begins with our wounds and our willingness to allow the God of compassion to begin to clean them out. And then, it begins with our willingness to live free of it in front of others. Because the moment that I begin to live free of the things that have hurt me and wounded me, Others around me will understand that I was embarrassed of that person. And that I was wrong. And that's why I let them go. <coughs> See, oftentimes, the biggest hindrance to truly starting over is that we can't let go of the pride we can't let go of our pride long enough to let go of our pain That is my challenge in this new year. My challenge in this new year is to begin to let go of the pride so that you can let go of the pain. My challenge is to allow the God of all compassion to come down into your heart and begin to look at your wounds and to touch them. Because being counted among the faithful and being sent out into ministry, that's the easy part. It's easy because once our lives have been completely touched and changed and once those wounds have begun to be healed, it's easy to not stop talking about our Jesus. It's easy to tell of the miracles that he's, he's done. It's easy to start over and to begin a new season. This year, make this the year that 
to allow those wounds to be touched by the God who heals and be so eager for it that you can let your pride go and truly live let us pray Heavenly Father as we go today Lord as we go out and begin the new year Father may it be with that in sight may it be Lord with that hope in mind Lord that we may open up to you allowing you into those places that we're ashamed letting you touch those places that hurt and Lord living for the first time may this new decade be a decade of life for those who call upon your name, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Hope to see you in the fellowship hall for